So let's sum up what we said about growth. The message about growth, uh, which is probably the most fascinating topic in economics is, economists didn't study it for a long time. When they started to study, it was due to facts. That is the fact that during the whole 19th century, the economic uh, system kept developing at a very fast pace, something that had never happened before, before economic system had changed, sometimes a lot, but never at that speed. So all the literature, philosophical, anthropological, sociological, psychological, and blah, 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 that has emerged in the last 150 years, roughly since Marx broke the spell and said uh, there are philosophical reasons to say that maybe uh, we got some problems. Forget about the fact that his analysis, uh, the analytical part of his observing the problem might not have been, you know, either correct or very logical. Point is that he broke the spell in the philosophical environment. Since then, we have had uh, a, a inundation, a tsunami of criticism of the society we live in. Uh, and this also has to do a bit with economics. That is, there is an, an economic way of looking at it, at this very interesting contradiction. If you study a bit the history of, let's call it human civilization, in plain words, what human wrote and said uh, for a few thousand years in various countries and places around the world, you might notice the following very strange thing. The people complained very little when life was very harsh. Very little. People were used to live, have an expected life of 40, life of 35, being tortured, being burned alive, being torn apart, the most insane violence and conditions, living conditions that were as miserable as it gets and then more, okay? And there were people complaining and say, this is unjust, God will punish you, uh, you're not a good king, you're not a good pope, you're not a good prince, uh, you're a thief, blah, blah, blah. But very, very seldom you would see uh, the dominant literature saying, what a rotten society we live in, what a disastrous thing, we are destroying humanity, things are going terribly wrong, uh, something must be done, this is uh, blah, 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 none of that, none of that. You had some utopian writers, but most of the utopian writers wanted to fix something, which was that there were poor people and rich people all the times, lucky people and unlucky, powerful and powerless. And but there was seldom a discussion, not, never, not seldom, never. I can't remember a single period in human history in which before the middle of the 19th century, in which intellectuals spend most of their time writing that uh, this is it, this is the end. We are in such a uh, disastrous situation that this is the end. Okay. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, um, as things started growing, there was a kind of bifurcation. A number of people got all enthusiasts, engineers, uh, certain class of scientists. So you might have read or know about the big enthusiasm, second half of the 19th century, the so-called positivistic view of everything, which came from, uh, they use the word positive, not in the sense that we use it uh, in, in research, meaning just describing um, more or less objectively what we think is uh, is the way the world works. Oh my God, let me take off audio because even if I try every time to stop WhatsApp from disturbing, I keep getting messages and I do have unfortunately a lot of people that write in my WhatsApp. So let me find the audio and turn this off. Where is the audio? Audio, 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 audio. audio. Windows 11 is complicated. When you get used to one window, you get trouble with the other. I don't know where the audio is on Windows. <laughs> 11, somewhere, <laughs> forever. If it makes more sounds, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll shut it up. Um, so as I said, you know, people took these two different paths, remarkably opposite. 
uh, among the positive one were the economists, right? The economists uh, were happy with, uh, with things. And at a certain point, they even said, oh, it looks like there is a lot of growth. Exactly when the economy said, looks, there is a lot of growth and it seems to do to all this change of technology, new ways of doing things. Lots of other people were saying exactly the opposite. Yes, there is growth, but this is dehumanizing us. It's making us terribly unnatural. It's destroying. God is dead. Uh, uh, the world is unjust, uh, blah, blah, blah. So and since then, there has been, and it's now more than 150 years, a kind of two cultures living in uh, in our societies, especially the Western society. One that tends to be extremely positive, in my view, sometimes naively so, you know, oh, everything can be solved, science will do miracles. Think of the enthusiast these days about digital, these days, it's 30, 30 years, about artificial intelligence, digital technology, information technology, bioengineering. Uh, you often have people talking about this uh, scientific advances or uh, engineering techniques as if they uh, they will solve everything. They will dramatically made us into demigods or semi-gods, right? So extreme enthusiasm on, on one hand. Um, and on the other, this view that uh, we, we live in the worst period of human history that uh, the old world is uh, coming apart. Economic research in this has been somewhat divided as well, right? So Schumpeter started the positive view, the positive view, innovation, technology, the entrepreneurs, income grows, you change, blah, 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 okay? But in parallel, there has been uh, a growing concern of the fact that while there was all this growth on average, dispersion, was increasing. We will see next class, which is why I wanted to add a couple of class, that this thing about dispersion, otherwise known as inequality, uh, is has to be qualified. Okay, has to be qualified. Uh, let me actually give you immediately the bottom line. No, it's not true that by any means and by any unit of measure, the world is more unequal now than it was a thousand years ago or even two thousand years ago, or even. 200 years ago, okay? The world was a lot more unequal then than now. Still, it's unequal. And, uh, and so you have a part of the literature, which is the second part of what we'll discuss today, that focuses on this inequality. And another part that focuses on, uh, on the positive part, the fact that the average goes up. One way of thinking of it is that, you know, some people just look at the first moment, some people look only at the second moment. Uh, that's a bit of a silly way of, of describing it, but if you're familiar with elementary statistics, that's a way of thinking. Should we look on only at mean or should we look only at standard deviations? I guess we should look at both, right? Maybe also kurtosis and skewness and, uh, and the old uh, moment generating function, but that is complicated. The moment generating function is a complicated object. We don't even know if it exists. Uh, well, it's a fascinating thing. All right. So that's the old thing. And the literature on growth, which has come late, has been a bit unequal. Uh, this I have already said five times, but let me repeat it one more. So this makes it six. Uh, it started out in what seems, not in my opinion, but objectively in the opinion of everybody, the right foot. The guy that started out says, this is a quantitative difference from the past that makes a qualitative difference because innovation are happening very fast, because uh, um, we change ways of producing and the goods we produce and the technology so fast respect to the past, the idea of observing stable, regular, steady state prices and the kind of simple equilibrium we have been theorizing in the Eurasian market is a bit off the window. Uh, it's not going to work. The static equilibrium is going to be disrupted all the time. And so doing economics on the basis of stationary state, as we have done so far, is silly. It's not going to help, uh, um, gonna help uh, our, uh, our understanding of, uh, of reality. Okay. Uh, 
So we have to try to study something a lot more complicated. That is a world with cyclical oscillation and all kinds of perturbations of stability induced by the continuous changing of technologies and goods uh, that we call technological change. But then we started out on the right foot and we abandoned it, maybe because it was too complicated. And also, as I said, uh, this has been a theme of, uh, of the class, because economists at the end are not like physicists and are not like mathematicians. They don't really study eternal problems. Or better, they do study eternal problems, but they don't know. And they call it in different ways. Because what they tend to study is what happens out there and what becomes the news, what becomes the concern of politicians and the people and the entrepreneurs and the workers and so on. And these practical matters, true, tend to be down under related to eternal theoretical problems that are those that we've been... Uh, I turn off my own light with my screen, sorry. That we've been uh, uh, studying uh, uh, and discussing during these weeks. But when the Great uh, Depression came, economists said, oh, let's, not, let's stop talking about growth. There is no growth. Uh, in fact, they got convinced that the only way of growing was to become uh, a socialist country and do planning. And they said, the problem we have to do here is to solve unemployment. They started out in the 30s and went on until the 50s. So when the economic research re-emerged from the long period in which it got concerned only about depression and unemployment and started thinking about growth, uh, it had uh, the Arrow Domer model in its hand. And the Arrow Domer model said, yeah, you know, there might be growth, but it's very rare, very unlikely. In a market system, you either had depression or explosion that then brings about financial crisis. That's the solution. Theorists said, well, maybe not. You know, Maybe technological change sometimes is very small. It simply means using a way of producing things slightly different from the previous one because there is too much capital or too much labor. And that was the argument of Solo. So the problem is not really to understand why we grow by accumulating more things. The problem is to understand how we stabilize the economy and uh, avoid avoid uh, uh, the oscillation that our Domer uh, predict. All right, and this was the situation in the 60s. And as we have pointed out, this again created another bifurcation inside the profession. Theorists kept thinking about growth in very abstract models and elaborated a number of things. And macroeconomists dedicated themselves to business cycle, basically. Business cycle, business cycle, business cycle. The problem was always the Keynesian problem. Do we have unemployment? Do we don't have unemployment? Can we, what's going on? Okay. Uh, is fiscal policy useful? Is monetary policy, policy useful? This went on. The old 60s and 70s are dedicated to this. The 60s are the years of uh, optimism, again. Uh, not optimism in general, like in the positivistic view of the world, but optimism in the sense that monetary and fiscal policy can do fantastic things. They can keep the system very stable. And then as soon, but this was also a bit of a, if you have to read a bit the history of the 60s. The 60s were the second half of the fifth, after war, uh, the Korean War, uh, in Europe it had started already earlier. The Europe, Europe did not get affected uh, did not get affected by, uh, by the Korean War. The Americans did, but uh, Europe had no impact. Those were very good decades, the 50s and the 60s. No big shock anywhere. Not even big technological shock. There was really no big technological innovation. There was a lot of adoption of good technologies that had been invented in the 30s and the 40s. Okay? And as soon as a shock arrived, which was on one hand, workers saying, look, productivity has increased a lot. We have made a lot of investment. You are earning very huge profits. Why don't you give us a little bit more money uh, given that you need us? Uh, that's called, uh, in Italian, it's called autunno caldo. In around the world, it's called wage uh, conflicts. But anyhow, that's what happened basically starting in the middle 60s. And then also the Arab sheikhs and other oil producer came around and said, oh, you know, you're using all this oil that we pump 
And uh, because we used to be colonial possessions until uh, 20, 30 years ago, you're also paying very little because the oil extraction, all the companies are all yours. British Petroleum, Exxon, this and that. Well, we're going to nationalize some of them. And even if we don't nationalize them, because the oil fields are ours, we're going to change the deal. So give us more money. So those were the big shocks between late 60s and early 70s. And as soon as the shocks happened, because they were real shocks, as we call them, people realized that fiscal and monetary policy was of no use, basically. Did very little. In fact, during the 70s, fiscal and monetary policy mostly damaged the, the response. It, it created the illusion that something was being done, but actually did not uh, help resume growth. And so economists kept thinking about that and they forgot about the growth thing. If you look at the literature in the 70s in economics and early 80s, growth is completely out of the picture. Nobody talks about growth. Everybody talks about stagflation, expectation, rational expectation, pricing, uh, uh, monetary policy being effective, not effective, non-accelerating unemployment inflation, non-accelerating inflation, uh, unemployment rate, uh, zero growth, zero growth, okay? In the meanwhile, theories that actually worked on growth, but nobody cared. But then it's very interesting, in the middle eighties, a guy, a bunch of very famous guys that had made their reputation in macro, in studying business cycle and contributed a lot to understanding of business cycle. First of all, Lucas, but also Barrow and others said, oh, by the way, there is this problem of growth. Um, why don't we talk about growth? There are the poor countries and the rich countries. And they started to talk about growth in the way we mentioned during the last lecture with this thing called the new growth theory, which basically said, oh, the old growth theory doesn't exist. They have nothing to say. And we need to explain why India and China and Brazil are so poor. And the way of doing it is to, um, to build new models uh, that say basically that what was the old point of that literature, if you read? It's all about the rich will remain rich and the poor remain poor. And this is a fascinating point of view that has attracted a lot of people. Even today, you read people talking about growth and say, oh, it's obvious that the rich become richer and the poor remain poor. Now, you understand, this is strictly false. You actually all live in a country that used to be poor, very poor. Right? Half of the world, more than half of the world today used to be extremely poor. If you go back only 50, 60, if you go back to World War II, there are very few rich countries and they're rich, so to speak, because even Germany and France and Italy are not rich, right? There are some very small number of rich people, but they're not rich. You can think of England and United States being rich, but even there, it's debatable, right? Now, there are, by the standards of 1930, of 1920, there are probably 2 billion people that have become rich. The Japanese, half of the, in, the, the Chinese, 20% of the Indian, 20% of India is a lot of people, you know, it's 300 million people. <laughs> Uh, most Europeans, even the Eastern Europeans that we look at them, Polish, uh, Hungarian, and they are kind of poorer than the Italian, poorer than the French, French are nevertheless much richer than they used to be in the 20s. You know, go read some, even don't read an history book, read a novel, read uh, Eric Ball, uh, the story of his grandmother. And, uh, and you will see how they used to live in Ukraine or in uh, Romania or in Poland and so on. So they all fable that the rich become richer and the poor stay poor is a fantasy. It was already a fantasy in 1985 when Lucas came up with the mechanics. It's certainly a fantasy now. Nevertheless, for a long time, people wrote models that did exactly that. 
And you see, the mechanism is very simple. Think increasing return is very simple, right? With increasing return, if you are poor and if you're at a low level of capital, you also have very low productivity, right? And if you have very low productivity, you don't have much of an incentive to invest because the incentive to invest comes from the return you expect tomorrow, right? My productivity is low, why invest it? I get very little. So if I start very poor, that was the kind of intuition that people use. If I start very poor with very little capital, I never invest and I remain poor forever. Instead, if I'm already rich, my productivity is high. And so I find it good to, it's convenient to invest. And so I grow even more. I know that this sounds very silly because it never explains why the damn Brits in 1750, that were very poor and had almost no capital, nevertheless did invest and did change technology. But you will see that a lot of the so-called new growth literature is all built around this thing, all built around this thing. And the external effort were just a way to get uh, the increasing return. What was the idea? Well, you know, my productivity per se, my private productivity is standard. That is, if I, as a function of my capital, my capital is very productive when I have very little, then the marginal productivity, as I keep adding, the marginal productivity decreases even if total productivity increases. And then eventually the new additional unit of capital I add to my plant, to my factory, is not so productive on the margin. But if Daniel invests in his factory and Alessandro and Filippo, I'm gonna mention the five that I have around me on the screen, and Filippo and Ariana Diego invest, then their machines affect mine positively. Their doing things right makes my things doing things even better. And then all together, we get high productivity. Now, obviously, this, if there, are, there is a way of telling this that sounds right, right? Because when one thinks, how do I get an economic system to function? I need all the parts to function. You can build a very nice business, but if the transport system doesn't work, if the electricity doesn't work, if the mail system doesn't work, if there are no roads, uh, blah, 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 then your, your company go broke, right? So there is a sense in which is true that economic development is a systemic phenomenon in the sense that it requires not one entrepreneur doing things right. It requires many people doing things right, right? It requires workers to learn to be punctual. People learn to... Uh, follow their procedure, and so on. Correct? I mean, think about in, in the country you live, you know, how many people are upset and move there first because internet doesn't work. There is no good communication system. The airports are what they are. The judiciary system doesn't work, okay? So in order to be competitive, you need the system to be efficient. If the system is not efficient, your lonely effort would not work. So that's a fact. You can go ahead and try to model this as a network system, as a system of input output, or you can go in my opinion, backward instead of ahead and say, oh, then this is just a matter of external effect and increasing returns. Because you see, when I say it's external effect, it's like whatever I get from Daniel, I don't pay. Whatever I get from Alessandro, I don't pay. It's just an external effect. It happens for magic. In fact, it's so external. Remember what an external effect is. An external effect is something that I do, but I don't mean to. It affects you, but I don't care. I don't pay you for the effect. You don't pay me for the effect. We don't discuss it. It's, we don't contract it. It's just the way it is. It happens by chance. Okay? Sure, we can 
try to model network effect and interaction among industries and service as if they're all external effect, or we can look at them uh, in their interaction and realize that there are market transactions going on. If there are no market transactions, there are political decision incentives and so on, okay? The increase your return externality approach takes the first route. It says, no, no, let's just look at the big picture. Now, as a story, this is also known as the Caldor uh, theory of growth. Uh, I think I mentioned this already uh, in class, right? right? Caldor observed that there was this thing, productivity and growth, productivity and income increase together and decided that the causation was from income to productivity. Notice that the observation that Caldor and all the other make is very old. Yes, productivity and growth, in, uh, productivity and income increase together. The idea being that income increases because we managed to increase productivity. But you can reverse it. And then though, you have a very funny theory because you see the problem is one thing is to tell a story. And one thing is then to use the model to take the seizure. I can tell a story that says growth is systemic. So for example, China has problems in some areas to grow because they have some bottlenecks. For example, they don't have enough human capital. Some of their services don't work as efficiently as the rest of the economy. And so they become a drawback. Their financial system is, due to the fact that it's all statalized, is also inefficient, makes a lot of bad choices. And so the process of growth in China that was very fast for 30 years is now much more slowly because there are a lot of components at the systemic level that are missing or grow slow. But what would you, if you use an increasing return model, what is that you do at that point? You conclude that increasing returns are no longer there, that the externalities are finished. Right? How do you explain China growing at 12% when they're poor and then growing at 6% now that they have twice the income as before using an, an increasing return now? Sure, because they all their increasing return for a while, then they go down there. Yeah, sure, and then what? You know. You see the, the conceptual problem? The conceptual problem with that story is that if you look at the data, first of all, you look wrong. That is, you assume that the data says that only the rich grow and the poor don't, which is totally false historically. And then you say, oh, okay, but growth is a systemic problem, blah, blah, blah. Let's therefore simplify it and model it as external effect the interaction we have between one sector and another and, and, and portray the whole thing as if there are aggregate increase in return, then that thing works decently as long as you have a phase in which income and growth, the income and growth, oof, income and, and productivity grow, go together. And then it looks like, you know, higher income, higher productivity, higher productivity, higher income. And you can play the game with what causes what, but as soon as you have a China, or you have an Italy, or you have a Germany, or you have any European country, every European country grew at six, seven, eight, nine, Italy, 11, Spain, 12% in the 60s and 50s. And now when they grow 1%, they're happy. How do you explain that with increasing return? Right? Well, that's the status of growth theory right now, okay? That's why here I said, is it a matter of increasing return and externalities? No, history definitely uh, doesn't say that. So what's missing? What's missing is that we don't have, I mean, we have a lot of words, me too, everybody, all the economists have a lot of words, a lot of blah, blah about technological change and innovation. But we don't have a causal model of innovation, technological change, 
then we can say, okay, that's coherent with historical evidence. We don't have it. We have little pieces, for example, if we look at what I said before, Europe growing so fast in the 50s and 60s, and we look at the historical evidence, it's clear that what was going on was adoption. The Europeans were adopting technologies that had been tested elsewhere, that had been created elsewhere in the United States in particular during previous decades and during the war, and the adoption made it very easy for them, right? Um, and then that stopped. And now the question is, okay, fine, I understand what's, what goes on in the 50s and 60s, but then what happened? Why did they stop adopting? Right? So in particular, why were, say, just to stay in Italy, given that we have Italians here, why was Fiat so good at imitating Ford and General Motors in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and until the middle of the 70s? And then when it was the Japanese or the Germans that they had to imitate, they did not do it anymore. Right? Think about it. Fiat was a competitive company in the car sector until the early 70s. After that, it stopped being competitive. Toyota, Honda, Nissan became much more competitive. BMW, whatever, Mercedes. Why? Why you can imitate Ford in 1952 and you cannot imitate Honda in 1982. Do we have a model for that? No. Um, is it maybe uh, for the same reason we addressed in previous lectures where you were talking about Amazon and Menarini? So why did the Menarini provide the same customer experience as Amazon? Because basically Fiat and other uh, car producer maybe were afraid of imitating such an ambitious model. I think you're referring to the lean model. Is it true about uh, Japanese? I'm referring to whatever they did, right? They, they, they improved the design, they changed the production uh, rules. If you think, I mean, it's not just one element that has, uh, uh, you know, in what sense Audi is a big success. They're not particularly lean in their production schedule. They're not Toyota. They're not uh, kings of uh, the just-in-time. Uh, they have incredibly high-quality engineering. It's a variety of reasons, right? They have high-quality engineering. They have good design. They have uh, high-quality production, so very little recall, very little pieces that break down, right? So there is a variety of things. Uh, if what happens is, as there were a variety of things with Ford and General Motors, point is that we were able, and this is just an example, you understand, to imitate that and not. So everybody in Italy, let me give you another example, uh, Giovanni. In Italy, everybody likes to say, oh, Olivetti. Mm -hmm. I mean, a guy the other day kept telling me, oh, we could have had Apple in Ivrea. I don't know what the hell he meant. Yes, Olivetti was one of the first companies in the world that said, oh, maybe we can do small personal computers. And then they failed. You know, I'm one of those guys old enough that I used it. My first job temporarily before coming to the United States, I did a little bit of a research at a research center that used to be at the time in Campo Manin uh, called IRSEF. Okay, and we started input output table and there were some Olivetti PCs. Then people say, oh, the politicians didn't pay attention. Well, politicians didn't pay attention to Apple either or to Hewlett Packard. They made it. Why didn't Olivetti make it? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't have a theory why, okay? Mm -hmm. But they didn't. 
not only they did not become one of the innovators, they did not even imitate Apple. Because at the end, you know, think of Dell or other. Think of Microsoft today, you know, I'm using a Microsoft Surface. Microsoft was not an innovator or a leader in producing machines. Hardware was not their business, right? But now they make very good hardware. But I'm very happy with the Surface so much so that I bought two. I'm trying to show it, but I can't. It's too blow. Okay. I have two that I use. And so that's, you see, Giovanni, what the problem is? Yeah, Why yeah. are we not imitating the imitator? So Microsoft is an imitator. They learn from Dell, from Toshiba, from Apple, and made their own machine. And they sell. Why is not happening? Not only in Italy, even in France or in Germany. So there is a whole sector out of which Europe has bailed out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I see. It. You see what the problem is? I don't have an answer. Huh? I'm just saying this is the thing we can't explain really well. My cue, well, it shows there in the slides I, I'm showing is that politics matter. Politics matters a lot in all this, but politics matters in a very different sense than just you know day by day politics. As I will try to, to discuss it in a moment because it leads us to the topic of inequality. Uh, but basically we don't have a theory. If an right. all of growth theory is a bit of a waste of time right now because the problem is that to create causal model of innovation, technological change that are coherent with what happened in history. And we don't have a single one. Right. We have models that put emphasis on uh, externalities, increasing returns, uh, monopolistic competition, competition, my case, but none of them, none of them is capable of saying, okay, let me use my model to understand the economic growth of Italy, France, Spain, Germany, England during the last 200 years. Or even a combination of models, because one could have a meta theory that says, look, this model explains the early part and this model explains the later part. And here is the transition, is how the economic system moved from looking like model one into looking model two. That's okay, nothing wrong, right? Biologists, when they explain you know, cell behavior in the body, they have a model of aging that tells you why your body cell reproduction function according to one model when you're 10 years or even your age, probably. And it behaves in a different way. <laughs> when you are my age, but then they have a meta model or a transition model that link the young body to the old body. And they have some tentative to explain aging and how aging modifies cellular reproduction and, and blah, 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 right? So we don't even have that. That's what I'm pointing out. So that's given, given the, the, the nature of the class that is supposed to be foundation. I don't want to go deeper than this, but I want to make you aware that we don't have a satisfactory model of economic growth. As we said, the other class, we have a bunch of descriptions, but they're essentially description of what happens to national income accounts. So why do I say the politics matter? I say the politics matters because when I try to capture the factors that play a role in the verbal description of history, then I realize that the number of things that come into into play is very large and they're all affected 
by what we can call or what happened. Filippo moved to the right and Ariana moved to the left. It's very interesting. Zoom is moving you around. <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> All right. Um, so, for example, let's take a, let's take some example, right? So, let's take some extreme. Forget China. China is obviously the most obvious example that that uh, that it matters, right? But take local example. So, people keep debating in Italy about. North and South, right? And they say, oh, that's a proof that if you're poor, remain poor, and if you're rich, you, you, you become richer. Because look at Milan. They were richer than everybody in 1860, and they're even richer now. And you say, ah. And look at Caltanissetta. They were poor in 1860, and they're still poor now. And you say, yes. And then you look more carefully and says, oh, look at Rovigo, or Belluno, or Udine. They were as poor as Catania and Catanisetta in 1860, but they're not now. On the other end, look again at Belluno, and Rovigo, and Treviso, and so on. Some of them were catching up with Milano very fast in the 80s and 90s, but now Milano is ahead again. Not only. Look, say, at Ancona and the area around that. Nothing happened there, apparently, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And they were kind of poor in the 70s. Then in the 80s, people started to discover that they were making kitchen and leather stuff and so on. And for a while, they grew. And now, huh? Complicated. And so on. So when one, when, starts, when one starts looking carefully, one realizes, first of all, that it's not true at all. Again, even at such a small scale, like cities and region and provinces, that if you're poor, you remain poor, and if you're rich, you become richer. Not true. Because look at Torino and Milano. If you look at Torino and Milano in the 60s, you would have said, oh, Torino is going to go ahead, right? The car industry, and, right? And now you say, oh, Torino, you know, is behind Milano. And other things, if you look at income per capita of Rome, you realize that the income per capita of Rome is very small, very small. It's small, it's little compared to Milan in 1950, but now it's much bigger. And also there you say, oh, where are the factories? Where is the innovation? Where are the entrepreneurs? You find none, but still you find the income. So you have to ask another question again. In this case, it's really politics in the, in the simplest sense in the very simplest sense, okay? But the point is to show the heterogeneity. There is an enormous heterogeneity. And then when you, you go back a bit, you say, oh, okay, you know, it's attitude, it's the rules that people follow, it's institution. So a colleague of mine has become very popular by writing lots of papers, lots of books in which he keeps saying institutions, institutions make you rich, make you poor. Forget about the fact that another strictly colleague of mine, and since he had his office next to mine, Douglas North, uh, had said that 50 years before, in fact, as an historical matter. The point is that even that explanation is not an explanation. Because the institutions of Bozen and Venice and Vicenza are the same as the institution of Caltanissetta and Cosenza and Catanzaro, and Lecce, or not. The schools are the same, the law is the same, the judicial system, everything is the same, the language, the prime minister, the second minister, even the other are made by people, and people are different. Ah. <laughs> people are different in what sense? Yeah, you and I are different. You're younger than me, you're healthier, we have about the same amount of air, but you got a longer beer. <laughs> what is the sense in which you and I being different matters? You see, that's the problem. I understand people are different. People are always different. Even if we are very many, I think it's impossible to find two genetic uh, 
to humans' DNA, identical, strictly identical to each other, apart from, from twins. So no, I agree, people are different, but what is the theory? The theory cannot, so you see it's there in the list, right? Heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means this, that people are different. I don't have an answer for that, but I do have a question. So uh, right. if we consider so that, uh, as you said already, economics is a complex system and those are just initial conditions, but the point we are trying to, to get the initial conditions of growth, starting from the outcome that we see. But if it is a complex system, well, it's not easy to do, right? I, no, I don't know even if it is. Too. I'm just saying that we don't want to admit that, we, that it is the problem that we have, and we have no answer to that problem. Indeed. No? That's all I'm saying. And I'm saying, you know, sometimes we, 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 sorry, when we write things like, uh, why did he do that? When we write things like it's institution, right? We think we get the illusion of, uh, of having found an answer. But then you think a little bit deeper and you say, no, that's not an answer just being confused, which is why the next bullet point says complicated issue, which takes us back to the initial classes. And then it says economics as analytical history. If you remember what we said at the beginning, we were talking about what's true, what's correct. Blah, blah, blah. And we said, you know, the economics try all the time to find universal laws, a bit like physicists or chemists or biologists. Because we say at the end, human beings are the same type of animals over the globe. And yes, they may have changed a bit. That is, there are reason to believe there has been genetic drifting in one direction or another, or mutation in one direction or another, even over the recent centuries. But there is also plenty of evidence that this genetic changing is relatively small. It has mostly to do with the functioning of our brain and some feature that may have developed. In case you're interested, I'll give you references or something. Uh, for example, there is a, a bunch of guys, large group of geneticists and, uh, uh, that insist on the fact that having learned to read, to read and write has affected uh, our brain functioning remarkably and in the sense that it's tend to favor certain brain. Are you cold, Philippe? Is that that cold? Yeah, I'm in a Kafuskari room and, well, it's good. Yeah, we notice you're freezing. <laughs> All right, we'll finish early so you get warmer. Uh, and then we'll meet, um, actually, well, before you go, let's actually, given that it's, uh, we, we figure out a bit the dates for next, uh, for next class, right? So we, we look at the calendar together. Okay, so uh, let's go back, right? Uh, so economists have a reason to look at certain rules that are uh, uh, almost constant or somewhat universal over history and across population. But we also understand that if they exist, they must be at the very, very basic level. They might have to do with what we may call deep preferences. They may have to do with something that has to do with brain functioning and span of attention and decision making at a very abstract level. Then as soon as you go up, the heterogeneity jumps in. And it makes the aggregate outcomes that we call norms, culture, values, institution, rules of behavior, blah, 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 hierarchical system, power system, very different. Very different. So we happily theorize, I did it again yesterday with a bunch of colleagues here to do history, that Chinese people put authority and agreement with authority approved truth. It just came up. There was a very clear situation <laughs> in the university. And we observed the dramatically strong patterns that our colleagues, academics of Chinese origin, all tended to 
side with a solution that put on the top, let's not have a fight and respect authority. Whereas the Europeans tended to have a position that was fuck the authority, let's try to figure out what's going on, okay? Uh, there were very few Americans in the old thing because the po academic population is mostly uh, non-American at least here. So, but but that's uh, but there were some Americans in it. And so we said, you know, once again, and you understand that as cannot be genetically induced. Maybe it is, but I have no evidence that it is. But it's certainly one of the things that we call cultural, and we don't know really what it means. What does it mean exactly? culture. Because some of these people feel instinctively bad at getting into a fight with authority. It's almost emotional. It's not a rational thing. One would say cultural is because I studied Dante and I didn't study Shakespeare. But it has nothing to do with Dante and, and Shakespeare. It has, uh, oof. This thing always goes away. Anyhow, the heterogeneity is, uh, is, is very big. And so, that tells us that why we try as economists uh, or social scientists to find some universal rules of human behavior, as soon as we go to observable, that is, we go into history, right? They go above the single individual, the single isolated individual, then it's very hard to find uh, the universal rule. And then what you have to do is the thing that I call analytical history, which is you take the historical facts and try to uh, give them a logic, a modeling logic after the fact. Back, you know, you go backward, basically. You say, okay, this and this thing happened. How can I tell a story that, uh, that somehow captures the, 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 the main ingredients of, uh, of this, uh, this historical phenomenon? I think economic growth theory would be a lot more interesting if it were able to do that and uh, therefore recognize the politics here, and here's why I put the words there, Politics in the sense of the police, the interaction of humans, their decisions about which rules to follow, whom to give power, whom not to give power, and so on. Okay? Because economic history did not happen in a vacuum. It was not just the prices that moved or just the investment that took place. And by the way, you know, that an accusation that people that don't like economic research or don't like economic approaches to things or don't like economics at all, even in its many varieties that I've shown you, an accusation they point out to is, oh, economists are so dry, they think everything is reducible to economic calculus. Well, I hope after this glass and after Filippo dies of uh, uh, low temperature, <laughs> please send some help. Somebody's near San Jobbe, send some, <laughs> some warm tea. Let's call the Vigili del Fuoco and send some warm tea and, and blankets. Uh, it's, you know, if you look at the reading of, uh, of social scientists, people are quite, quite aware that, um, that there is this link here. The link we'll try to explore uh, in the next two classes. That because we are heter heterogeneous, then we have to establish hierarchical structures. Then we have established system of property rights. You see, if we were homogeneous, if we really were identical, like ions or atoms, or an electron is an electron is an electron, right? And instead, a new one could be Michele, Daniel, Filippo, Diego, Arianna, Alessandro, and even if we don't see them, Lorenzo, Mattia, Giovanni, and so on, right? And they're all different. They're heterogeneous. And because they're heterogeneous, in any moment, they establish relational rules. Even now, even in a small class like this today, you know, with some people that have not come because they didn't realize there was class, we have established relational rules. And this established a system of property rights implicit on what you can do, say, who decides. Some, some are given, yes, there is a professor that eventually has to give an exam and some people have to get a grade. And so this establishes certain attitudes. Some people are taking the class for grades some people are just listening for learning. 
That's politics. Probably that's what Alessandro had in mind when he said, oh, you know, people in Catanzaro are different from people in Treviso. Yes, but in what sense they're different? And how do I model how they became different? Because if you want, remember the last topic was income inequality and that's the way I want to approach it. I don't want to invent the income inequality was born with capitalism because, or with the industrial revolution because it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> it's so ridiculous as a statement that I don't know why we debate it. There was so much income inequality for such a long time that poor people were sold as slaves because they couldn't pay their debt. Talk about income inequality. Just think, you know, just thinking of that, the fact that once upon a time you could be sold as slave because you couldn't pay your debt tells you in what sense one can actually state that inequality increased with economic development as opposed to decrease. No? And so, yeah, I, the way I would like to do it, we'll do it in the next two classes, is to try to look at it starting from this consideration that is very clear within economic theory, the heterogeneity of humans and the incredible difficulty of modeling that heterogeneity. So it's very funny, right? So there are aspects on which in economic theory we exploit heterogeneity very well. For example, the old theory I told you about prices and demand and supply and market equilibrium is all about heterogeneity. There would be no demand and supply if we were not heterogeneous. Right? Because if everybody has the same taste and everybody produces the same thing, then there's no trade. Right? So trade exists because humans are heterogeneous. It would be actually the world without heterogeneity would be a world without economic growth. Right? Think about it. heterogeneity. Economic growth, technological change come from the fact that we are heterogeneous. In fact, it might be one, okay, this is a bit more like science fiction, not science, but I'm finishing and ending the class. Think about it. monkeys are probably much more similar among each other than we are and mosquitoes or ants, even more. Right? Within a population, ants are very similar, they're not very heterogeneous. And so nobody deviates from their assigned genetic role. So there's no innovation. Either the innovation happens genetically, right? there's a flip and, the, and a new type of ant pop out and with whatever, you know, bigger stick that beats up everybody else and reproduces. That's the innovation. But there is no technological innovation because there's no reason. They're all identical. So there's no incentive. I know, it's, it, this makes for a movie. If somebody can know how to make a movie, this can make for a novel. You can make a nice novel here of going back and forth of heterogeneity and uh, economic uh, technological change appearing and disappearing uh, according to the degree of heterogeneity. But a, a world with homogeneous people is an incredibly boring, static, poor, fucking useless world. But everybody lives alone. If I, what's the point of talking to you if you're identical to me? Right? Can't even have sex. So the representative agent you see is useful as an abstraction, but you have to use it for a second and then stop because it's very dangerous. It takes you down a bad. So economists are quite aware that heterogeneity is the key to most things we call economics. It's just that we don't know how to handle it properly. We know how to handle it when it comes to consumer demand, preferences, prices, demand, supply, uh, marketing, uh, those things. As we move at a more, well, I don't know, no more complicated, the different level. So. 
So have you ever asked yourself why you respect, why people always accept that power? We finish here. I leave this for next uh, for next class, so we'll, uh, we don't freeze Filippo because he looks really freezing. You concern you you really made me concerned. Have you ever asked yourself why everywhere in the world, at different level, people accept power? Power. Any group, even your group of friends, immediately you establish power systems, power structure, hierarchical roles. And this defines property right, obviously, right? As soon as you establish a power system, you define property rights. I don't know if I may add, like maybe we do it like unconsciously, we accept it unconsciously, but they are like, these structures are quite useful. I mean, they are, um, we are, we can get comfortable with them. Like it, they are, we can get like a, an order and we can live uh, like more structural, like with a, with a defined structure that helps us. And it's yeah, like useful, like practical, pragmatic. Um, can I add one thing? Maybe we, uh, the extent to which we accept power depends on which payoff we, the, we, we are able to get from that power structure. Like for example, in Saudi Arabia, where uh, I mean, uh, there's not that much of uh, spe uh, speech freedom, uh, people are um, quite willing to maybe give it a pass on it because they pay very little taxes and there's plenty of money circulating. That, that's just an example. Maybe it's wrong, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think it, it depends on what payoff we get from it. Sure, uh, but if you think a moment, this is true of any, I mean, this is the typical economic uh, way of thinking which I agree, it seems, I mean, we call it economic, but uh, um, um, sorry, the message better tell that I'm teaching. Okay, no, I agree. So, but there is, you see, in some sense, everything we do has to do with incentive. I'm here teaching to you for a series of incentive, monetary being the last one, right? And you're here listening to me for another series of incentive, true. Um, but uh, how can I say? Well, you will, will, well, no, I know what to say, but uh, that all pairs up in an half an hour speech. What, what the point, but let me think about the point is that we, the humans, have a way of, of creating power structure that has a degree of homogeneity and constancy. In that way, it can be studied. So let me try to simplify so I give you some thought for next week, or yeah, not Thursday, but next week. Um, the thought is the following. While it is true that our accepting or not accepting a, a power system is case by case, always incentive-based, in order to have some hope of a theory of power and heterogeneity and therefore institution, property rights and even equality, we need to find some common traits, something constant, some aspect. Otherwise we cannot do modeling or analysis. We can only do case by case, but then case by case, case are fantasticillion. So it doesn't become as, becomes, we can write very beautiful novels. And in fact, there's a lot of novels about that. And I'm not saying they're not interesting, they're interesting, but then we can't make it into an analytical thing. You see what I mean? Yep. You see what I mean? 
Yeah, Professor Bardo, is not what you actually stated uh, previously regarding growth, that we, it would be better to create history of growth rather than... Right, but it has to be an agreement. Remember what I also said, this model explains that and this model explains that, but I cannot have each single episode a single model, otherwise there is nothing. So nothing analytical, it's just a storytelling. So if I have a model of adoption that is able to capture France and England and, and Italy and Germany and Spain and Portugal and Greece and China, well, you know, I have a model of adoption. And then if I have a model that explains how I go from adoption to stagnation, Italy, or I go from adoption to jumping ahead, Germany, uh, fine. But it has to work at least for a, a set, an ample set of cases. If I have each single story a different model, then 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 I have to raise my hands and de declare <laughs> surrender <laughs> and say heterogeneity is so much that I can't even try to model this. I can only tell stories. That that's all I'm saying. And and I'm not saying a priori that this may not be the case. Huh? Be careful. Well, you will see. I mean, there, there might be, I have something to say in the second lecture that might say, we can only tell stories. I'm not saying. I, I, don't, I don't think we have a lot to say right now as sociologists, political scientists, economists. Here I put everything together about power relation and how they evolve and how we accept it and how they distribute property rights and how they do inequality. I think there's some little thing we can say, and we'll try to tell you some ideas that have come out here and there over the last two, 300 years in among researchers, uh, but I don't think we have anything very solid. Contrary to relative prices that are solid stuff. William, go.